Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to the course of real-time embedded system. We're going to continue our chapter number three. This is going to be our lecture number 10 about journal purpose processors. So let's have a recap of what we have discussed in our lecture number nine before we move on to lecture number 10. In previous lecture, we discussed journal purpose processor benefits. Its basic architecture, that is controller, data path, memory, we talked about program counter, we talked about instruction register, we discussed the architectural consideration, the concept of pipelining, we discussed two widely used memory architectures, we discussed cache memory, we discussed programmer's view, we discussed assembly language instruction and their characteristics. In today's lecture, we will focus on memory modes, its example, programmer consideration, we will look into parallel port device driver example. We will talk about operating system, development environment, software development process, running a program, testing and debugging. At the end, we will talk about application specific instruction set processors, commonly known as ASIP. We will discuss two most commonly used types of ASIP, that is microcontrollers and DSP, Digital Signal Processing Platforms. We will talk about customized application specific instruction set processors. We will talk about selecting microprocessors, which microprocessor is good, which is not good, which are the advantages of one over another. We'll talk about the recent evaluation of general purpose processors. And finally, we'll have a summary of chapter number three. And today we'll finish this chapter, inshallah. In this slide, we're going to talk about the addressing mode of general purpose processor. There are five commonly used addressing mode, namely image here, register direct, register indirect, direct, and indirect. In first image addressing mode, there is only one operand field and that operand field contains the data itself. Whereas in register direct addressing mode, the operand field contains the address of the register in which data resides. So this register operand field contains the address of the register where data resides. So data resides in the data path register. Number third is register indirect. In register indirect addressing mode, the operand field contains the address of the register. So the operand field contains the address of the register. So this is register file. So contains the address of the register, which in turns, now this memory location in turns contains the address of memory location in which data resides. So our data resides here, okay? So this register contains the address. This is the address. Now at this address, the, there's a mem address of the memory location, this, where actual data resides. In direct addressing mode, the operand field contains the address of the memory location. So this operand field contains the address of the memory location. So this is the address, there. here is your data. Whereas in indirect addressing mode, the operand field contains the memory address which in turn contains a memory address of this data okay so for those familiar with structured languages direct addressing implements regular variables and indirect addressing implements pointers you might be familiar with regular variables and pointers now in inherent addressing the data can reside in register called accumulators. In index addressing direct or indirect, open must be added to particular register to obtain operand address. And we usually add this with base register. Now jump instructions are most of the time use relative addressing. We do not have any jump instruction here, but we will talk about the jump instruction in our next example section. So that was about the addressing modes, operand field, register file, and then we have memory contents. 
So let's move on to next slide. These slides contain uh, various instruction set examples. Um, there are like seven instructions, assembly instruction. And the initial four one are data transfer instruction. As you can see, move, 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 and move in initial four instruction. Then followed by add, subtract, which are arithmetic operations. And finally, we have branch instruction that is jump zero. So in first instruction, as you can see, we have move, RN, direct. So the opcode here is zero, 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 zero. And the first byte size, we have four bits for opcode and we have four bits for register and the direct is the memory address, which requires eight bits. So what we are going to do, we are going to copy the contents of memory direct into register RN. So this is direct addressing mode, followed by move direct comma RN. So this is also direct addressing mode. We have opcode for 0001 and four bits for RN and then we have address in the second byte. What we are going to do in this we are going to copy the contents of RN at the memory location and direct. Okay. So this is similar to the previous but it is like opposite. Previously we were copying the content of memory into register. Here we are copying the contents of register into memory okay now in next statement move at the rate n rn comma rm here we have opcode 0010 we have register with four bits rn then we have in the register rm so this mode is our register indirect addressing mode here we are going to the register then this register contains the address where we copy the actual data rm so we are going to the uh, address of rn in memory and then we are going to copy the contents rm here okay so in next instruction move rn comma hash image here. that is our image addressing mode so what we are going to do the first part contains the opcode 0011 and then the register four bits and then we have imager the direct value so what we are going to do we are going to copy this imager value into the rn then followed by add instruction we are going to add rn and rm and we are going to place the result back in rn so like we do not need full for full byte for this rm register we just need four bits okay because the register is of size 4 bits, whereas the address is of 8 bit here in this particular case. Whereas in sub instruction, we're going to subtract RN minus RM and going to put the result back in RN. Finally, we have a jump instruction, which we usually call branch instruction. So jump 0, we will jump if RN has the value 0 so the opcode for this is 0 1 1 0 so rn in the first part then we have address which is operand so the address is relative so program counter will be incremented with relative value not with the one value now this statement will execute if and only if the rn holds the value 0 so these were like seven assembly instruction in which we discussed several addressing modes and we also discussed the jump instruction with relative addressing. Now let's move on to next slide. Uh, so in this slide we are going to discuss the C program which is structured programming and then we are going to convert that program into equivalent assembly programming so if you look here what we are doing we are initializing a variable total putting in value 0 then we have a loop that start from i is equal to 10 so this loop start from 10 and then this loops goes to 1 i minus minus so this loop will start from 10 
as long as i is not equal to 0 this loop will continue and we are decrementing i so first time i going to be 10 then i going to be 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 once the i becomes 0 this loop will terminate and we will go to next statement so what we are going we are adding total plus is equal to i it means that total is equal to total plus i so in first cycle when total is equal to 0 and i is equal to 10 we will have the value of total 10 in next cycle total will be 10 and then i will be 9 so we will have 19 in next we will have 19 plus 8 and then we have 27 plus 7 and this will continue as long as i is not equal to 10 so now how we can mimic this in assembly instruction so total is equal to 0 here we are describing it we are moving the value of 0 that is immediate addressing mode direct value going to R0 register we are moving the value of i is equal to 10 in register R1 we are moving the value of 1 in register 2 we are moving the value of 0 in R3 and this is our loop instruction jump 0 we will end this loop if r1 become 0 so you can see that r1 is currently what 10 so once this 10 become 0 we will end this loop so in fifth you can see add r0 plus r0 comma r1 so this is similar to total plus i plus is equal to i so R0 have the value 0 and R1 have the value 10. So 10 plus 0, we get 10. Now, we will decrement R1. We decrement R1 because we need to make 10, 9. So subtract R1, comma R2. So R2 got the value of 1. R1 got the value of 10. So 10 minus 1, we will get 9 jump 0 r3 comma loop so r3 you know that r3 is always 0 all r3 is always 0 so it will jump back to loop now jump 0 r1 comma next r1 is not 0 r1 is 9 at this point initially r1 was 10 then it's 9 it's 8 and so on so we are going to add r0 So in next cycle, R0 has the value 10 and R1 has the value 9. So addition will be 19. And again, we are going to subtract R1 from R2. So R1 will become 8. So this loop will continue once R1 become 0, we will get here and the loop terminates. Now your task is to try these two things. Handshaking example and then a counter. So in handshaking examples, first write a code in C language. Wait until the value of memory 254 is not 0. Now your program should be in waiting condition as long as this is not 0. Once this is 0, you need to set the next location 255. And wait until M54 is 0. And then you have to wait and as long as M54 is 0, then you have to set this to 0. Now you can consider this location as some ports location. Okay. And the harder one is that count the occurrences of 0 in array stored in memory. So you have location from 100 to 199 in memory. Now you have to count how many zeros are there in location from 100 to 199. Let's move on to next slide. In this slide, we will talk about programmer consideration. So the first thing that the programmer need to consider is program and data memory space. The embedded system programmer must be aware of the size of the available memory for program and data. For example, a particular processor may have 64 kilo program space and a 64 data space. 
the programmer must not exceed this limit. In addition, the programmer will probably want to be aware of on-chip program and data memory capacity, taking care to fit the necessary program and data in on-chip memory if possible. So embedded processor typically have 64 kilobytes of memory whereas 256 bytes of RAM which is expandable and we need to know about the register how many registers are there how we can access them in assembly language okay so assembly programmer must know how many registers are available for general purpose data storage they must also be familiar with other register that have special function for example, a base register may exist which permits the programmer to use a data transfer instruction where the processor adds an operand field to the base register to obtain actual memory address as I have told you in previous slide. And lastly, the programmer needs to know about the input output facilities with which the processor communicates with other devices. One common input output facility is parallel input output in which the programmer can read or write to parallel port by reading or writing special registers. Another input output facility is a system bus consisting of address and data ports that are automatically activated by certain register. So in next example, we are going to have an example of input and output in which we will work on the line printer port which is commonly known as your parallel port and we will send a signal and we will receive a signal so we are going to perform the input and output operation and we will access that port so that was about the program consideration you need to consider three things program and data memory space registers and input and output and usually we need to know about the interrupts as well let's go to next slide in this slide we are going to look at the parallel port driver example using parallel port also called lpt in many computers base address of lpt1 is 3pc hexa we are going to see this in program so the task here is to use assembly program to configure computer parallel port for digital input output as you can see in the diagram on the right hand side computer is connected to parallel port and then it is connected to switch via pin number 13 of the parallel port and it is connected to LED with pin number 2 read and write to three special resistors so the example is the parallel port pin configuration is shown in table where we have input output direction register addresses and LPT pin so the register addresses are 0th bit of register number 2 is for output 0 to 7 bit of register 0 from pin number 2 to 9 and we are going to use this pin so pin number 2 and this is for output because this is LED so we are going to use this 2 and this is 0th and then for pin number 13 pin number 13 comes here this is pin number 13 okay let me highlight it for you in red pin number 13 sorry and this is pin number 13 okay and then we have associated with that is pin number 4 so number 4 bit of register number 1 is associated with pin number 13 that is input and 0th bit of register number 0 is associated with output. So what we are going to do in our case we will use pin number 2 for output which correspond to 0th bit of register 0 and pin 13 for input which correspond to 4th bit of register number 1. So let's start the code on next slide and let's understand how the input output parallel port works. So in this code, this is the main code. This is the main code. So what we are going to do, we are going to go through void min void while one when 
whenever the condition is true, it's always true. We are going to call the subroutine procedure check port. Okay. So check port, this is the code of check port. So what we are going to do, we are going to use two registers here. Number one is AX register and number two is DX register. So what we are going to do, you, we are going to save the contents of these two registers, save the contents of these two registers by pushing them in stack. Then what we are going to do next statement is move DX comma 3BCH. As I told you, 3BCH is the address of LPT port. So for register number one, which corresponds to input register. So we are checking the input. If input is one, we are going to turn on the LED. If input is zero, we are going to turn off the LED. Okay. So this is how you access the register number zero base address plus one. Okay. So we are moving this 3PCH plus one to DX. And then this DX is 16 bit register. Keep in mind. Okay. Now we are inputting DX into AL, which is 8 bit register. So read register 1. We are reading the register 1, so we are checking the content of register 1. Okay, this is how we check read the contents of register 1 in AL, comma DX. Now what we are going to do, we are Taking and of whatever is in the air with one zero. So one zero, if you see one zero hexa correspond to four bits, so it will mask out everything will be changed. So this will mask, it will affect only one zero will affect only fourth bit. Okay, so fourth bit is this, this fourth bit, this okay, this fourth bit. So now we're going to check whether the fourth bit is one or not. So that's why we have taken the end. Okay. So now in next, we're going to compare what is in the AL register. If AL register is zero, it means that the switch is off. Okay. So what we are going to do, if it is off in next statement, jump not equal to zero. So it means that if comparison is not zero, it means the switch is on. We will come here, switch on. In switch on, what we are going to do, because we have to turn on the LED, we are going to load the LPT port and the base address zero for register zero. Okay. So move similarly DX comma three BCH plus zero for the register zero. Now we are going to check what is at the Input okay, so we are going to read AL comma DX read the current state of the port We are going to read the pin 2 state Now we are taking R so you know that R will not affect anything. Okay, R will not affect anything. So we are just So this is R AL whatever is in the AL we are taking 0 1 H So 0 1 H if you take out the binary, so only the first bit is 1 it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So this is what we are doing. So we are only taking the OR with last pin. It means we are not interested in all these. Okay. And this is the zeroth pin of register number 0. So what we are going to do now we have read out the what is on the port. Now we are going to output. What we are going to output, we are going to output DX comma AL. So whatever is at AL, we are going to write it on the DX register. So now if AL was 0, 1, it means like there was one on that pin, it will be written. Now if switch is on, off, we will come here. If this statement is not correct, we will come here, switch off. Now switch off, we are again going to load the same 3BH plus 0 for base register 0. But in this case, after reading, what we are going to do, we are going to turn off the LED. So what we are going to put, the masking is 1, 1, 1, 1, 
1 1 1 and 0 so we are putting 0 f e h and then we are putting it to the dx resistor so obviously we are putting f e in the dx resistor so led will be off and finally we will pop the values of dx and ax once we are done from here okay and then check port and procedure we will come back here so this is how we can use parallel port in assembly programming to check whether the switch is on or off if switch is on we are going to turn on the led so how we are doing it we are taking the masking okay after reading the port we are doing it masking we are taking mask with and and we are taking mask with or so this is how it works moving on to next slide so in this slide we are going to discuss about operating system like what is operating system what action it performs so operating system is optional software layer which provides low level services to program or applications now what does operating system do it schedule multiple programs for execution or even just multiple threads thread is just a small portion of program within one program it manages files memory management and do security management okay now program makes system calls to the os what is system call system call is a mechanism to op invoke the operating system it is similar to function or procedure in structured or high level languages so it's just like procedure or function in higher level languages whereas in low level languages it is system call so you have an example of system call here the system call is to open the file so db file underscore name out dot text this file is in database and the file name is out dot text we are going to write the assembly code in order to open this file so first of all what we are going to do this in open id 1324 is if we move 1324 to r0 it is it it tells you like to this is in the open call so you have to open some file so which file you have to open you will move the file name to r1 l register address of the file name now int34 is used to initiate like cause a system call happen something jump 0 r0 l1 if 0 error okay like this will jump if r0 value is 0 okay it will jump if r0 value is 0 so it will jump and will come here and you will display like there is some error if it is not 0 we will read the file bypass the error and we will jump to it means it's n so this is important like moving 1324 tells you like it's a call for open once it is system call for open we need to provide the file name then we need to initialize means start and then we have like some comparison what to do read or show error so this is how it works now let's move on to next slide so you must need to be sure like where is operating system it's just an additional layer to help you carry out some services and provide services to program or applications schedule programs and do lots of many that let's move on to next slide now in this slide we are going to talk about development environment development environment consists of development processor or host and target processor so you have two processors in development environment make sure one on which you write code and the one for which you write code like target processor so on development processor the processor on which we write and debug our programs so usually pc as shown here and target processor for which you write program or on which program will run in our embedded system often different from development processor so this processor is different from this processor okay as you can see in the figure this is target 
this one is target this one is host so let's move on to next slide let's see how software development process works in development environment so in software development process there are five things that are integral number one compiler number two assembler number three blinkers debuggers and profilers so in compilers one important thing is cross compiler cross compiler is usually used when we run a program on one processor but it generates codes for some other processor okay like we have host and we have target same procedure is performed by the assembler assembler generates a code for some other processor linkers basically you can see links two things linker links binary files with library to make an executable file debuggers are used for testing if something go wrong we go back and we program profilers are used for analyzing the program so there are two phases in software development number one is implementation phase number two is verification phase in implementation phase we either write code in c language or we write in assembly language then we use compiler or assembler to generate the binary file for the targeted system so once these binary files are generated we use linker to link all these files to combine these files and library is used to for providing services like for example you are using stdio conio c out c in files like that so how c out work how c in works how printf works this is provided in the library so once executable file is there we goes to the verification phase in verification phase we test and then we profiler means analyze okay now let me give you a brief description of linkers linkers allow programmers to create a program in separately assembled or compiled file okay so let's go to next slide so we discuss development environment then we discuss software development then we are discussing running a program so if development processor is different from target processor how can we run our compiled code so we have two options either we can download to target processor or we can simply simulate downloading to target processor means that we have actual processor or actual system simulate means just we are going to simulate on that particular machine on which we have developed the code simulation in simulation instruction set simulator runs on development processor but execute instruction for target processor this is important okay so we have instruction set simulator that runs on the development processor or host processor but they generate instruction for the target processor or execute instruction for the target processor okay let's go so in this slide you can see that there are two views shown there a implementation phase and verification phase of desktop processor so this is for desktop processor whereas in b implementation and verification phase is shown for embedded system okay so you can see that we are using an emulator here so the code is not running on the development processor but it is running on the emulator using so we are using emulator either we can download to board or we can use emulator so iss is for when we are running the program in on the computer so iss give us control over time you have seen that we use breakpoints we check register values we set register values we use step by step execution but we don't interact with real environment so all of this is happening on the development processor okay so you have seen that in matlab you have seen that in c that we do step by step execution we check different register we set breakpoints so this functionality is provided by 
instruction set now if we move to download to board download to board means that we are downloading the program to the actual board use device programmers run in real environment but not controllable so once you are running the program on the real real device it is not controllable it's just like you have burned the code on some microcontroller now it is running and you cannot control anything you have to go back and reprogram it whereas you might have seen that we can use emulators emulator is in between between the real hardware and the uh, what you can say simulator runs in real environment okay at speed similar to the real environment sports some controllability from PC so emulator is just like a kit okay where you can use different input different outputs so it is like that okay so it's a compromise between the what you can say using the real hardware or going for the simulation so the middleware is emulator okay let's go to next slide so that was about the general purpose processor its development process its execution process and we talked about the addressing modes we talked about the system call we talked about different device drivers now we are going to talk about the application specific instruction set processors now we have seen that in journal purpose processors sometimes too journal to be effective in demanding applications like they are too journal we cannot use them like where we have to focus on only video processing which requires huge buffers and operation on large area of data on these kind of applications the journal purpose processor is ineffective now application specific processors are targeted for particular domain now contain architectural features specific to that domain for example if we are working on the embedded control application the architecture of the processor will be closely related with the features of embedded control likewise for digital signal processing we have application specific processors for video processing for network processing for telecoms uh, it's not like there that ASIPs are not programmable ASIPs are quite programmable but they are not as general as general purpose processors let's move to next so uh, as i have already told you one of the common asip application specific instruction processor is microcontroller that is used for embedded control applications and the purpose is to read sensor values to set actuator values most of the time we deals with events and event happen in the form of bits when bit change their value that is present in embedded control application but it is not in huge numbers most of the time we see that video cassette recorder disk drive digital cameras washing machine microwave oven all of these are equipped with embedded control applications and here spp is some sort of like but you can say it's just like compare compression technique okay so now we'll discuss about the microcontroller features so microcontroller have features number one is on chip peripherals it has timers analog digital converter cell communication it provides clocks it provides some other functionality like pwm now these are tightly integrated to for programmer typically part of register space so all these timer analog to digital converter are typically part of register space we have just seen that if you want to access the parallel port we have to access those register and we need to set some values in that i've just told you it has on chip program and data memory you can have direct access to the chip pins specialized instruction for bit manipulation and other low level operations so they are specialized instruction like like the way i told you you have instruction for jump you have instruction for move so they are specialized instruction for bit manipulation and low level operation let's move to next slide so along with microcontroller there is another common asip processor that is known as digital signal processor 
Now, digital signal processors are used for application where we have large amount of digitized data, where data transformation must be applied fast. So we need high speed for data transformation and there is large amount of digital data. So the applications of these digital signal processors are cell phone, voice filter, digital TV, music synthesizer. What offers, what feature TSP offers? Several instruction execution units, like it has multiple instruction execution units. Now, in DSP processor, we multiply and accumulate in a single instruction cycle. Okay. Efficient vector operation at two arrays. Like we can add, we can subtract, we can multiply large amount of array data. Vector ALU, so we don't have like scalar ALUs. We have vector ALU, loop, buffer. And most importantly, it uses Harvard architecture. It means that it has separate program memory and it has separate data memory. It's not like microcontroller. We have on chip data and program memory. So we can execute and we can access simultaneously both data and program memory. Let's move on to next slide. So with the passage of time, we do not have like only microcontrollers or DSP processors to be the ASIP processors. Now we have customized ASIPs. In the past, microprocessors were acquired as chips. Today, we are increasingly acquire a processor as intellectual property. Intellectual property is like something new, which is not like too common, and we patent it, like we copyright it. So you can modify it using VHD model. Opportunity to add custom data path hardware and a few custom instructions so you can modify the data path you can modify the instruction you can add instruction you can delete instruction can have significant performance and size impacts problem the issue is that when you are going to customize the data path hardware you are going to customize the uh, instruction delete or add instruction you need to have compiler or debugger for the Customize ASIP. So that is the biggest challenge of ASIPs. If you have customized ASIP, you need to have debugger or compiler for it. Remember, most development uses structured languages, so we need compiler. One solution is automatic compiler debugger designation. So this is the link where you can get some information about the automatic compiler debugger generation. Another solution is retargetable compilers so you can have this link so anyways um, the the point of this slide was to let you guys know that we can have customize a sips so in customize a sips what we can do we can have these thing opportunity to add custom data path custom instruction and this so let's move on to next slide so this slide is about like selecting a microprocessor so about what point you need to keep in mind when selecting a microprocessor. So issues starting with the technical. So you need to keep in mind speed, power, size, and cost whenever selecting a microprocessor. Other development environment, prior expertise, and licensing. So you need to know like you can work on this development environment. Do you have previous expertise and if the license is available or not? So these are the thing issues that you need to understand before selecting a microprocessor. Speed, how to evaluate a processor speed. So processor speed is evaluated in different ways. Like the most commonly clock speed is instruction per cycle, but may differ. Instruction per second, but work per instruction may differ. You have Dire Stone synthetic benchmark developed in 1984. Dire per, Dire Stone per second. MIPS is basically million of instruction per second. So one MIPS is equal to 1757 dire stone per second based on digital VEX 17 by 1780, also known as dire stone MIPS commonly used. So these are the benchmarks for like uh, checking the speed of the processor. Either you can go with clock speed, either you can go with instruction per second, or you can go for dire stone. Likewise, spec is another standard for set of more realistic benchmark but this is mostly used for desktop computer ee 
MBC is another benchmark for embedded system. So you can check the benchmark like what is the speed, what is the power, size, cost, all you can do side benchmark, automotive, consumer electronics, networking office, automation and telecommunication. So the, this EEMBC provide benchmarks for all these automotive industry, consumer electronics, network, office, automation and telecommunication. Okay. So these two things are necessary issues and speed. Let's go to next slide. So this slide gives you the brief description of the recent journal purple processor evolution. So Pentium 3 you have here, one gigahertz clock speed. It has two caches. So 16 kilo bar of two caches, level one, and 256 kilo bar of cache level two. It has a burst width of 32. It has million of instruction per second around 900 it has power of 97 volt it has 7 million transistor and prices around 900 and we are talking about the time when it was like launched then we have ibm power pc 750 x bus speed of uh, clock speed of 550 megahertz then we have two 32 kilo caches of level one and 256 cache of level two then we have a bus width of 32 and 64 it has 1300 million instruction per second the power requirement was very less 7 watt it has 7 million transistors and price was almost same then we have mips r5000 250 megahertz 2 into 32 k level 1 cache 2 way set associative then we have 32 64 architecture MIPS not available, power not available, 3.6 million capacitor and so on. In microprocessor, you can see here, we have Intel 8051, 12 megahertz, 4K ROM, 128 RAM, 32 input output primer, and universal asynchronous transmission. We have eight bus width and around one million instruction per second, 0.2 watt power, 10K transistor, and price was quite cheap dollar seven and then we have motorola 68 hc 811 3 megahertz of clock speed 4k prom 192 ram and 32 input output ports with timer watchdog timer and with spi it has same eight bus data and address and mips of around 5 million instruction per 0.5 million per instruction and then power of 0.1 relative low, low compared to the intel one then it has same transistor size and then dollar five plus now coming to the digital signal processor we have 160 megahertz and one uh, sorry 80 megahertz and then 128k s ram 3 t1 ports direct memory access i3 adc 9 dse then in lucent dsp 32c we have 16 K. Then we have 2K data serial ports. However, the bus width of T1, the Texas instrument was 16 and 32, whereas the Lucent was 30, 32. Now, here you can see there are huge difference, like 600 million instruction per second, whereas the Lucent perform around 40. Rest of the things are not available. So that was about the evolution process of general processor microcontrollers and DSP processor. So that was about the chapter number three. If you have any question, you can ask me at the end. Thanks. So in this chapter, we talked about journal per processor. We looked at the controller, data path, memory, types of memory. We talk about the structure, programming languages. Uh, we talked about like how they prevail, but some programming understanding of assembly language is necessary many tools available including instruction set simulators and in circuit emulators we saw that either we can use iss for running the code on the same development processor or host computer or we can use emulators to run the code as the way it is running on the actual device or hardware and we talked about AC processor, we talked about the microcontroller, we talked about the DSPs, 
and then we talk about like choosing among processor is an important step like when you have to choose general purpose processor when you have to choose ASAPs and when you have to choose microcontroller and you have to choose DSP processors and so on thank you very much